welcome to another episode of the Liz Career Coaching Podcast. I am Liz Arena and I'm your host. I thought it would be a great idea to do another episode around the topic of networking. I thought it would be more fun to do it over a glass of wine and make it uh, as part of my uh, happy hour series. (laughs) And one of the best people to have as a guest is none other than a power networker and dear colleague of mine, Katherine Jackson. And while this will be more of a casual conversation, I do want to formally introduce Catherine. Uh, so Catherine is a lifelong career development and organizational culture nerd with extensive experience leading career services, running a small business, and writing about career and work life. She is an experienced hiring manager with over 20 years of supervising professionals, graduate students, and interns. As a first-generational college graduate, she is also a lifelong Chicagoan. She's a proud introvert, likewise. And I don't want to read this part, but I'm going to have to. (laughs) I'm a Southsider, but I'm a Cubs fan. But Kat, I know Catherine is a White Sox fan. I'm literally a few blocks away from (laughs) from guaranteed rate. (laughs) So welcome, Catherine. So happy to have you on the show. Thank you, Liz. I'm so excited to be here and hello to anyone watching. Yes. And because this is happy hour, I will share, I am enjoying a glass of red wine. And what are you having, Catherine? Um, So I am married to a Wisconsin guy. So we are a Northwoods old fashioned household. So that is what I'm doing tonight. Yes. Cheers. Cheers to everyone. Yes. Yes. (laughs) A little sip here. Mm. That is what we do, especially during holiday networking, right? I feel like there's always opportunities to connect with other people and human beings and just having that conversation. And it doesn't have to be super formal and terrifying and scary. So I really wanted to connect with you because I really do feel that you are a power networker. And so let's take it back a little bit, Catherine. What what is your personal experience with networking? Especially you mentioned, you know, that you are an introvert. Why are you so interested in this whole topic of networking? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me on. This was a really exciting invitation to receive. Um, oh, let's see. So it's really two pieces. Um, one is um, I'm a lifelong career development nerd. Like I said, um, I was one of those people who in high school knew I wanted to major in psychology and then went on to do graduate work in counseling and the whole time really doing research with different professors. Um, I went to undergrad at University of Illinois at Chicago and I did research under three different professors there all on workplace and career related topics. Um, And so early on, I started to appreciate the importance of the different things that made us successful um, in the workplace and in our career pathing. Um, At the same time, you know, from a young age, I thought I was just shy, which I'm sure Mm -hmm. a lot of kids thought that when they were young. And through college and through doing research and really great mentors, I started to understand the difference between introversion and extroversion. And what I what I love is what I've seen over the last 25 years in lots of spaces in management, organizational psychology and career development and in higher education, we have really taken the conversation about introversion versus extroversion. We've we've unpacked it. We've, mm. we've taken it down from one versus the other or one's better than the other. And I think there's a much more mainstream understanding of introverts versus extroverts is not about shy versus outgoing, but it's how we derive energy and how we spend energy. And so for me, figuring out I was an introvert and figuring out what that meant and how I met people completely impacted how I understood networking and how I completely revised my own tactics for um, networking and um, informational interviewing and really sort of building my network. Yeah, that is so intriguing. And I love how you said how you redirected and even just how you, it's a, it's a mind shift, right? And so I agree. I'm also an introvert and the same thing. I'm like, oh, but I'm not shy because I enjoy people, but maybe if it's a large crowd, 
that's very intimidating for me. But for, like you mentioned, you know, even conducting informational interviews, that is a little easier because it's one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. And so just changing your approach, I yes. think is really intentional and, and strategic. Yes. So because you can speak, you know, to an introvert's, you know, maybe perspective, and of course this is your, your own, mm -hmm. in your experience, what type of advice do you have for, for people who are, you know, who, who claim to be introverts or, or really identify as introvert, mm -hmm. but they're ready to get out there and, and network? What are some tips you have for them? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not only an introvert, but I'm also a highly anxious person. So I take this very seriously. And there are some very um, concrete tactics that I use and that I recommend when I was at a career advising or in career coaching. So first of all, um, understanding that your tactic is going to be different than other people's and that's okay. There is not one correct way to build your network. And in fact, for some people, removing the word networking is the first step. So when I think about building a network, I think about it as sort of, um, it's kind of like people or friend collecting. I think about, okay, who do I need to talk to in terms of what information am I looking for? And so I set out to find one person, one person at a time. And so I look at channels that help me connect to one person. So I use LinkedIn extensively. I use my alumni associations, alumni mentoring programs. I use my sorority directory. Um, so I look at in, in cranes in the back where they have those announcements about what people are doing because you'd be surprised, um, especially Gen X now, given where Gen X is in sort of the workforce mm. layers, you'd be surprised who you'd recognize in sort of cranes or other publications like that. So I recognize that I need to do it in a different way than most people. Um, second of all is I remind myself that I need a goal. I am not the person and I don't know very many introverts who love to sort of float along in a giant cocktail party <laughs> or get sort of shoved into a holiday party. Um, we do better typically when we are goal focused. So what does that mean? Okay, so before I go into a group situation or an unstructured situation that feels a little bit unsafe, a little bit risky, I give myself permission to take breaks. I set out to get um, maybe a glass of water or whatever I wanna get so I have something in my hand. Um, and then I think about, okay, my goal tonight is to talk to two people that I have not talked to. Um, or even better yet, if you're part of like a professional association, I know a lot of those groups are having get togethers this time of year, um, ask to help out. Having a task to do like passing out name tags, doing check-in, like it sounds like a silly thing, but having something to focus on can drop our anxiety because it drops our sense that we're sort of free floating in an environment that we have no control over. So that's the most important thing to me to start with is to have a goal um, in mind, give yourself some permission to take breaks. Um, and if you can have some sort of role in the actual event, these things can help you approach the situation with maybe not zero anxiety, but a reduction in your anxiety. I absolutely love every single thing you just said. And I think it's just really understanding yourself and yeah. removing that overwhelming feeling of going into an event. And one of the things that you said that I'm, that really resonated, I, cause I'm the same way, like, I, you know, having a goal, I think that's foremost, most importantly, right? Why are you there? What are some of the, the takeaways? What do you want to gain from, from that experience? And again, connecting with another human being, right? Yeah. But I used to, you know, when I used to work in my previous office, I would, um, you would, you would actually appreciate this. I would connect with our alumni office because they did a lot of events. And so I always volunteer to attend their, you know, their, uh, their um, networking events where I would greet the alumni and that forced people to talk to me <laughs> and for me to talk to them. And that was my favorite because it felt safe. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started building my connections in, in my alumni network. Yeah. Um, so I think that is such a strategic move. I didn't even realize that, that I was doing that, but it totally worked. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. 
And so I wanted to, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned LinkedIn mm-hmm. and, you know, we were talking about social settings, you know, physical spaces, but I also wanted to explore the, the technology piece. What are your, your thoughts in terms of leveraging technology to, to build your network and how do you use it? Yeah, absolutely. I use technology a ton for networking and for gathering intel for career related purposes. So, and as an introvert and someone who is fairly anxious, that works really well for me. So LinkedIn, um, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. I moderate a couple of groups and I do a couple of things. Um, the first thing is I, um, make sure that my headline, um, so you look at your profile and and we know looking at screens, humans read in an F formation. That's how they look at the information. So your headline is really important and that's where you're gonna get the maximum SEO. So you wanna put words in there that attract other people to you. Um, things that, that seem natural, but don't really attract other people to you for networking are, is like a title, like your job title. And that's a very, when LinkedIn first started, everyone just kind of popped their job title in. And what we've realized over time is the way the algorithm works most effectively is to put keywords in there. So it could be tech enthusiast, it could be ed tech, it could be leader, it could be optimist, it could be empath. Um, so picking mm. words, when you think about sort of how you hashtag on Twitter, it's similar on LinkedIn. You'd want to think about words that people are going to sort of search for, and that's going to attract people to you. Um, the second thing is you have to build contacts, um, which means you have to be open to connecting with people that aren't necessarily in your contacts. You can do that by joining groups, There are groups for books, there are groups for passions, there are groups for your alma maters. Um, There are like super user groups. If you use Smartsheet at work or Salesforce, there's super user groups. So there's all sorts of groups to explore. And that's how you start building contacts outside of your network. What I do is I take it a step further. So I start building networks and I start meeting new people and I jump onto their profile and in the far right hand side of their profile, there's a, an algorithm there that says people who are looking at this profile are also looking at these profiles. And then I think to myself, oh, so I'm talking to this person about this, you know, the LinkedIn non-for-profit side of the house. That's really interesting but this person works for the Salesforce foundation. I wonder if I should be talking to them too. And honestly, Mm. that's how I sort of branch out my network. Um, I call it quietly one person at a time. And I've um, talked to all sorts of people that I've never met before. I reach out to them. Um, The response rate is probably 50, 60%. Um, And I just say, Hey, I would love to talk to you about what you do. I'll take 20 minutes. I make sure I give them a time frame so they know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm sure not to ask them to hire me, that I'm <laughs> looking to gather information, um, and that I'm also not selling anything. There's a lot of oh, sales yes. generation. You know, people are afraid to open their inbox on LinkedIn. Um, and I've had a pretty good um, response rate. I've been able to talk to all sorts of people Um, that I didn't know beforehand. And then they say, hey, let's connect on LinkedIn. And suddenly you're developing this whole group of people, whether or not you talk to them personally, you're still developing a group of people that you didn't have access to previously. And there are lots of examples that I could give you of how that served people really well. Oh my goodness. So this is why you are a power networker. I want people to just really hear what you just said. So first you're like, it's a 50 to 60% response rate. And that can be intimidating, right? It's like, oh, well, there's, you know, looking at the other side, well, that means like 40, 50% of people are not going to respond, but that's okay. And that's an, almost, you know, that's an expectation. And I think, again, it's okay that that happens. But then when you actually do get to connect with some of, some of these individuals, I bet you have met some amazing yeah. people through just cold connecting. Yeah. Yeah. People. And I think the upside of everything that's happened in the last year and a half is that people are looking to connect. And most people who work in the knowledge industries, 
um, have increased their agility with technology. So whether it's Zoom, Skype, WebEx, Google Hangout, you name the platform, um, most people are willing to give it a shot and talk to you. I think the biggest sort of challenge is to keep in mind that um, when it comes to video conferencing, some companies aren't allowed to use some platforms. So you have to be a little mm. bit flexible. Like if you're really a Zoom person, you might have to be okay with a Google Hangout or WebEx or GoToMeeting or whatever their company uses. But otherwise, um, I think when you tell them, like, I'm just gathering information, this is how much time I'm gonna take, um, I'm willing to accommodate your schedule, people are pretty, pretty open and interested about talking about what they do because almost everyone is interested in building their network and almost everyone for better or for worse has have been a little um, secluded for the last year and a half. And so, um, and if LinkedIn's not your thing, you can, you can shrink the pool and be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. If you go to, like I said, your alumni association, your Greek organization, your professional association, chambers of commerce, like many, many, many of these have branched out to have either directories and or networking mentoring software platforms. So there are, there are lots of different ways that this can be done. I'm just using LinkedIn because most people have heard of it. Yeah, and you know, speaking of, of technology and using all these different platforms, I know that you are also you also have presence on Twitter. I am not the most versatile <laughs> with Twitter. Yeah. Um, how do you how have you optimized Twitter in terms of, of networking? Yeah. Um, well, I'll speak for myself, and then I'll speak for people that I sort of um, help in this area. So I. And one of those people who um, I believe you have to have a really clear purpose, particularly on Twitter, because I was trying to explain this to an entrepreneur. Twitter is like millions of conversations happening at one time and you can sort of parachute in and listen if you want. So what I use Twitter for is I get very clear on what I'm looking, again, goals, very clear on what I'm looking for, very clear that I am not always welcome in all conversations on Twitter. And so if I wade into waters that are not in my wheelhouse, mm. I either take accountability for whatever I participate in, in terms of the conversation, or I just listen and watch and learn. And I think a lot of people have gotten burned on Twitter and are kind of negative about it because it can be um, a little intimidating. There's, there's sort of a a drop in accountability and some people feel like they can just say whatever. And technically they can, it's, it's Twitter. It's sort of an open space. So I think people have to have a goal when they wade into Twitter. And that's what I tell them, like know why you're on there, know how long you're going to be on there and recognize either from a, a gut feeling or a little bit of perspiration, or you're starting to feel uncomfortable. If you've waded into a conversation where it is not a good space for you to be in and have the discipline, to hop off of Twitter and do something, you know, where you're more comfortable. So that's how I advise people on that. For me, I, so I will, I have connected with a lot of recruiters, for example. So I do a lot of listening on Twitter to, I see what recruiters are talking about, whether they're for companies or whether they're contract recruiters, because they're talking about where there are gaps in skills, what kind of resumes they're looking for, mm -hmm. which companies they're having a hard time keeping up with filling all of the talent um, requisitions are coming in, what really irritates them about what they're seeing with clients, which are, you know, talent, students coming out of college, people coming out of grad school, people doing part of this great resignation. And so I use Twitter to follow a ton of recruiters, get that intel, I search um, specific ha hashtags, recruiter Twitter, med Twitter, law Twitter. Um, it's a way to, to find out what is going on in those spaces. Um, and really, I have learned so much um, from doing that on Twitter. If, if something is happening and you're not sure what the catchphrase is or mm -hmm. what's trending or why it's trending, I found one of the fastest ways to find out is Twitter. So I need to get on Twitter. I mean, I'm on Twitter, but I don't think I maximize its use because I don't think I've, I don't think I'm as comfortable mm -hmm. using it. I, you know, I'll post things on there here and there. 
But one of the things, you know, that you're saying, and I can see that, you know, getting into murky water or just conversations and, Mm -hmm. you know, I try to stay away from that. I have harmony as one of my strengths, so I don't like any (laughs) conflict. (laughs) Um, But I will also say, and I like to remind this to people, you know, my students and clients is thinking about your professional and personal brand, Mm -hmm. anything that you're going to write or put out there in Mm -hmm. social media that that you that it is aligned with your brand and how you want people to view you and see you so I kind of use that as a compass whenever I'm going to share anything in any of my social media platforms yes uh because I know sometimes I'll read things and I'm like oh that doesn't sit well with me and I'm like okay this is not the the space for it there are other ways um it's like kind of choosing your battles but it can really get complicated um so just being mindful of, of that as well Totally. I think we've all seen, if you follow anything in pop culture, there have been some situations recently where basically Twitter becomes a transcript Mm. of anything you say over the years. And so um, you have to keep in mind that once you put it out there, even if you delete a tweet, if someone has screenshot it, they've got it. So you do need to be mindful about, I think a couple things. One is what you say, exactly what you said, but also um, who and what you're following because that is uh, other people can see who and what you're following. And for some people, they don't care and that's fine. But for other people, um, that's very important part of managing their brand. So again, it depends on sort of your comfort level with um, the interpretation of your brand. Um, and everybody's in a really different space when it comes to that. Absolutely. Those are some great points. Now, you know, you and I have talked a lot about networking. Mm -hmm. And so I always love to hear success stories Mm -hmm. in your experience. It could be your personal experience or any, any examples that you are able to share. Uh, can you share any success stories in terms of uh, networking? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, um, really three that come to mind. The first, and and they're all all different platforms. Um, One is on LinkedIn. Um, When I first started a group on LinkedIn back in like 2007, there was um, a gentleman who I had never met. He had um, experienced a um, riff as a CFO, a reduction in force. So he he was laid off. And he decided that he was gonna use LinkedIn to build what he referred to as a sales force of people to make them aware that he had been laid off, that it was from a workforce reduction, not something he had done, that he had extensive experience as a chief financial officer, and that he was looking for a vice president position, I think is what, in a smaller company. And so he started collecting people on his LinkedIn profile and he would send us email updates of what he was looking for and really leverage the fact that we were coming from all different spaces and asked us if he had heard, if we hear of job leads to give him a heads up. And like two months into it, he had 500 people feeding him job leads from all over the place. And within a matter of months, he had a new, he had a vice president position in financial services, which is what he wanted to do. And he, you know, at the end sent us all a kind of a quick email of, his name was Larry. Here I am, here's where I landed. Can't thank you enough. If I can ever do anything for you, that would be my pleasure. And I, that was early, really early at LinkedIn. And I was like, wow, that is the power of building using technology to build a network because you're going to reach an entire group of people that you've never seen before. Um, second example was actually recently this summer, I was working with, with, a, with a veteran who um, was looking to make a pivot from associate, association management into um, data analytics. And so I just, I tweeted it out. I tweeted out, hey, um, I'm, asking on behalf of someone looking for data analytics, business, and I hashtag it data, you know, data analytics, business intelligence, BI. Um, and I had three or four recruiters um, instantly DM me in Twitter and say, oh, I'm working specifically to find veterans, send me his resume, send me his resume, send me his resume. People I have never met, we're all over the world. Um, and so now, 
that person is working specifically with recruiters who want to find veterans um, for these jobs. And th that's just the power of Twitter. And then the third was I had, um, I belong on Facebook. There's a number of groups on there. And while face Facebook is interesting because it's a smaller, typically a, a closed system, the groups on Facebook tend to be really robust. Um, and they're, they're, depending on the topic, they can be very welcoming. So I joined a recruiter Facebook group and I said, hey, I'm trying to prepare people to work with recruiters. And there's like 40,000 people in there. And I one day post said, you know, I'm having clients claim this and that about ATS, the tracking systems that people are always spinning mythology about when they apply to, you know, companies, websites, you know, how much of this is actuality and how much of this is just, you know, someone frustrated and complaining and 12 different recruiters weighed in and, and gave me advice and, and sort of de-escalated my client's panic. And I was like, this is what I'm talking about. Like this, I, you can read a bunch of articles. Absolutely. You can go to people's blogs. Absolutely. But like to be able to reach out over social media and instantly get all these people who are like, we're in the spaces, we're doing the recruiting. It's not all the ATS. So tell your person just not to, you know, over, um, don't over index on the keywords on resumes. Um, it's still going to be seen by humans. And so, I've used social media in a number of ways and, and I've seen people get what they were looking for. And that's what's what's really exciting for me and for for the people who benefited from these situations. Thank you for sharing examples using all those different platforms because they're all very different. And I really like the idea of that immediacy because I think that's what people are looking for. And like you're like you said, you know, there's articles and things that you're hearing, but to get live feedback yeah. from these recruiters yes. that is so key uh and so strategic and I love that you do that like I'm I have I'm learning I'm learning some <laughs> strategies here too <laughs> this is what I love about connecting with colleagues because I feel like I'm constantly learning and um adding to my own professional toolkit uh yeah. thank you so much for that Catherine sure. yeah <laughs> so of course you know I have I always have to you know maximize my time with with the people that I'm chatting with uh, so two different questions here. So one, in thinking about people that are currently, you know, looking for employment opportunities and networking is something that many people are uncomfortable with, or that, you know, there's that, that anxiety that comes with it. Yeah. What advice do you have in terms of first steps, even if it's a baby step for people that are, okay, I'm ready for that next career move, or I'm on the job market. What can they start doing? So this is what I tell everyone who doesn't like the idea of networking, which seems to be almost everyone. And that <laughs> yeah. is, so you have to, there was a, um, there was a, a, so I love the Chicago White Sox. Sorry. not sorry. We know, we know. Yes. <laughs> and there was a phrase, I don't even know from what decade, but it was like something like winning ugly, something like that. And I tell people like, you have to start even if it's ugly, which means you have to knock the first domino over. So you have to just pick somebody, maybe you ask a friend or maybe you ask a friend of a friend or a former colleague, but you've got to just pick someone and do a 20 minute interview, script out, and you only need like four or five questions because 20 minutes is actually a very short period of time for someone to talk about themselves. You just pick someone because once you do that first one, you kind of bust all the myths in your head that cause, because all anxiety is, is fear of the unknown. That's if we look at brain science, it is fear of the unknown, which means until you get through that first informational interview, what's in your head is the unknown. So once you get through that first, everyone I talk to has the same response, which is, oh, that wasn't that difficult. And what happens is it's sort of like yoga. The more you do it, the better, or, or running, the better you get at it. And the more you do it, the more efficient you become with your question answers. And the faster you start to figure out, oh, this isn't at all what I'm interested in. And then you wrap it up at 20 minutes and move on. Or this is, 
I want more of this information or that information. So the really important thing is to get the first one done and, and get rid of that fear of, um, of the unknown. So that's, that's a really important part. Um, then the second thing is that to, and this is sometimes harder for people, but have the questions that you want to ask the three or four questions written on a piece of paper and make sure that you're focused on listening to those questions. And sometimes with anxiety, particularly if it's bad enough where you get a, a cortisol flood, um, you have to really stay focused on those questions, which means turn your phone over, turn your, turn your phone off. Um, and in your mind, every time your brain starts to sort of wander away from listening to the answer, um, bring it back to what that person's saying. Maybe that means you're looking at their eyes on the TV or on the monitor. Maybe in your head, you think of a visualization of like a lasso, bringing it back in. Um, I use, I don't know if you ever, when you were a kid, like put your hand in a pool and push all the water around or in the bathtub where you push the water and then it comes flooding back. So I, I created a technique in my head. So whenever my anxiety would start to make me wander or take my attention away in my head, I do that vision of the pushing, like creating a path back to what the person is saying. So different techniques work for different people, but you have to find a way to listen to the other person because the, one of the worst things that can happen, particularly for an introvert or a highly anxious person is to let the distraction pull you away from being present. And then you're not listening to the answer, not catching the information you need. And in the worst case scenario, the person asks you a question and your anxiety has swept you away and you're not even hearing when they're interacting with you. So finding a technique that works, um, deep breaths, lasso, opening up a path in the water, whatever works for you so that you make sure and stay focused for that period of time. Last thing I'll say is don't make it too long. People get tired. You get tired of listening. Anxiety, you have two things going on when you're doing informational interview. You've got what you're listening to and you've got the the constant thought of I'm on Zoom, I'm on Google, I'm on video right now. Your brain's doing two processes at once which it's not really meant to do. We don't have computer brains, we have human brains. And so you got to make sure that you've got your plan together. These are some really interesting techniques and I feel like you're speaking my language and you're speaking to my brain. <laughs> <laughs> this is, like I'm really people was, I think this is really going to resonate with a lot of folks and I and including myself like just listening to you I'm like wow it's like she knows me and I've shared this on my podcast before you know networking and just how I feel or even just you know the, the anxiety that comes with it I mean I have social anxiety mm -hmm. but being able to get through some of these things and having again that toolkit and, and knowing yourself and learning how to adapt and navigate we can all do it. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time that I did even, even doing this podcast, mm -hmm. it was terrifying. Like my heart, even just, you know, pressing record, but I knew it was something that I wanted to do. Yeah. And like you said, I love how you frame that, you know, it's, it's the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And then once you do it, then you get a little bit more comfortable and you're like, okay, it's, it's okay. And then you take it to the next step. And like you said, you become efficient uh, yes. in, in that process. Yes. Uh, and I think what's, the, the thing that's happening a lot today too, and I think anyone who's job searching or thinking about job searching should know this upfront is a lot of companies really want, not necessarily when they say a referral, people always think, oh, buddy, buddy, somebody I went to college with or knows me well. No, mm -hmm. they want an internal person who has said they have just talked to you once. So you know, whether it's Salesforce, Aon, Accenture, KPMG, wherever you're looking, having this quick conversation with someone who works there, often those people will say when it's over, hey, if you apply for one of our jobs, put me down before you start the application process. That way it gets routed a little bit faster in the company. So that's when I say like, just do it, just, you know, knock that domino over because it can actually increase your odds of your resume getting pulled from, we used to call it a pile, but it's not really a pile anymore, <laughs> or like the, the queue. Yes. Um, but also will 
instantly connect you to somebody who already works there and really help um, shine a light on you as a candidate. That is what we call the hidden job market, mm -hmm, for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one last question. Yeah. You know, I, I have a, a mix of people that listen to this. Uh, and obviously I work at the University of Illinois Chicago. So I you know have students that also listen mm -hmm. to the podcast. Any advice for people that are going to be graduating? So students, you know, they're in a kind of different way of thinking. Yeah. What are some tips that you would have for college students yeah. in leveraging their student status and, and all that good stuff? Yeah, so a couple things. One is start practicing networking or informational interviewing with a smaller pond. So if your alumni association has a career mentoring networking program, like a software, um, and most universities have something, those are smaller pools of people where the alumni and sometimes friends of the university have raised their hand and said, it can be ugly. I'll still talk to you. Start practicing those skills there. Because if you think about the networking universe, if you will, mm -hmm. think of it as sort of like an equilateral triangle where the bottom, the big part is like the whole world. That's kind of daunting. The middle part is like LinkedIn or maybe your professional associations or, or like a neighborhood association. And the top part are often those smaller programs at your university. So start in the small part and start working those skills of just introducing yourself, your elevator pitch. So get, um, get good at making mistakes so that you can practice working through those when you, when you venture out either to LinkedIn or eventually in-person events or those types of things. Um, the second thing is, as you're doing your job search and as you start asking people about company cultures, ask them their opinion, because you will be pleasantly surprised, when I see a job description and I'm not 100% qualified because I'm just coming out of college, should I apply? Um, I ask this question all the time and I don't think I have ever gotten an answer that's much different than this. If you're 60% qualified, apply. Let the company say no. Yes. Don't rule yourself out. Let them say no because there is, there's a huge um, gap between open positions and enough talent. And it's a lot of reasons. There was a lot of people, there was just a, a big report came out. A ton of people took early retirement because of COVID. Um, so we've got that. We've got people who are traveling. We've got people who are taking a break. We've, so don't rule yourself out. Let the company rule you out. That's, that's absolutely fine. Um, so building a network, practicing networking, even if it's ugly, um, not ruling yourself out, um, and using those informational interviews to really, to find out what the titles are of the jobs that you think you're interested in, because they're not the same in every company. So you want, that's the other good part about talking to people is, hey, I think I want to be a data analyst, but I don't see that in your listings. Like, what is that called at your company? that will help you get that information and start to sort of connect the dots when you're looking at jobs at like, oh, this might work or that is this over here so that you don't miss out on some good, um, some good opportunities. That is such a great point. And I, I know that I have that conversation all the time. Well, the don't rule, rule yourself out. I always say, don't screen yourself out. That's, mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. And also when doing your research that there are 10 different ways for essentially the same position and mm -hmm. what is the culture of that particular organization. And then another thing that I wanted to point out based on some of the things that you were saying, and so I, I get a lot of you know university students, friends of mine that have kids in college that reach out to me on Facebook that they want mm -hmm. career advice. So I have university students across the board, mm -hmm. um, go to your career counseling office and your career center because there are all these platforms, different schools use different things. And sometimes students don't know that they actually have a career office mm -hmm. available to them. So making sure that you take advantage of them I and mean, you're paying tuition, yeah. take advantage of these, of these uh, platforms and these resources. Yeah. Um, anything else, Catherine, that you wanted to mention? 
Um, so there's a couple of resources that I love, 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 and I always recommend, particularly for um, introverts or um, highly anxious people. Mm-hmm. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, an engineer who took over, became a career services director, his name's Steve Dalton, and he wrote a book called <laughs> yes. The Two-Hour Job Search. Yes. And here's the thing. Like, even if you don't read the whole book, If you Google two-hour job search, job tracker spreadsheet, Steve designed this amazing spreadsheet system that helps people, and this is great for so many reasons, but it helps people when you're doing some company research and you want to figure out not only how to organize it into Excel, but then also how to prioritize it and not spend 10 hours a night applying for jobs. This is a great tool. He, it's out on, you just Google it. You can, it's, it's a shareware. It's out there. Um, he updates it regularly. And for people who spend a lot of time, you know, researching cause it makes them feel better. Um, but they've got to kind of giddy up and get their information together. Um, his spreadsheet from the two hour job search book is a great, just a really great spreadsheet. Um, the second thing that I always recommend to people is, and this is for traditional undergrads, non-traditional undergrads, graduate students, and encore career people too, is um, be really clear on your why. So Simon Sinek does a thing called Find Your Why. Mm-hmm. And, and here's, so this is not some big TEDx only thing. Here, here's what it is. The first 30% of his book, Find Your Why, and you, it's on, you can Google it too helps you develop an answer to the question, who are you? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And it's a very simple formula that he gives. And if you do the exercise, you will come up with your answer. And it's literally one line that you can expound on, but here's why it's a gem. It's for your cover letter. It's for your interview. It's for your about section on LinkedIn. It is literally the lens that you start looking through at everything. Like, do I want this job? Well, if my why is to help people and organizations get the information they need to make better decisions, to lead to a more fulfilling life, I am not going to go become an animal tamer. I am not going to, I'm not going to just take a job because I can, I'm going to be really clear on what gets, what gets me excited and what I'm looking for. And if you do his exercises and it's kind of like a storytelling exercise, you will arrive at what your, he calls it your why, what your purpose is. And even if it's, even if it's not pretty, it will help you answer that question of why are you interested in this job or why do you want to work for you know, name the company or why should we hire you? And that's the answer that trips people up a ton, whether they're networking, whether they're doing their elevator pitch, writing their cover letter, doing their about section on LinkedIn. So I highly recommend um, either the book or like I said, most of his stuff's on, um, on his website too, for free. I really enjoy that you just shared two different types of examples. So the two hour job search, I can attest works. I actually used it with my husband when he got laid (laughs) off and it worked and I've used it with clients too, that framework. Um, So that's very practical and, and very, you know, it's, it's, you you have to be very organized. Right. And then with the find your why that's the self-reflective piece. Mm -hmm. So being able to utilize these different types of resources, I think will be really helpful in, in, in that process of the job search or even making a career move. Uh, and this is why people, you need to connect with Catherine Jackson uh, and people <laughs> like Catherine. And this is why I love interviewing people because I learned so much as well. Catherine, how can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Um, probably the easiest is on Twitter. I'm at Catherine Kaysen. Um, we can put it down in the, in the, in the show notes. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I have a coaching profile under K Jackson nine, um, K as, and then like Jackson five Jackson with the number nine, not the, not the word spelled out. Um, but those are the easiest place to find me. I tweet about job leads, career advice. 
I rant about politics. So it's, that's pretty much what you're going to see in that space. And Instagram, it's very focused on, um, career advice, motivational pieces. A lot of what Liz puts out gets replicated mm -hmm. on my Instagram because she's got some, um, really golden nuggets that I like to share. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I definitely will be sharing that in the show notes. And I just have to, you know, say that it's been such a pleasure, you know, connecting with you. And I, I do have to publicly thank you as well. I always talk about having your allies and, you know, you are definitely one of my cheerleaders and I appreciate you so much, your, your, your camaraderie. Uh, and, and I just think <laughs> people need to have Catherine Jackson's in their lives. And I really, I really do appreciate you, Catherine. Um, so thank you. Oh my gosh. It's my, it's my pleasure. I mean, when you meet really good people who are doing really good work, you want to spread the word because, you know, career coaching is it's, it's different for everybody and everybody vibes with different people and that's okay. So I love connecting with other career development professionals because if someone comes to me and wants something, you might be the right person to talk to. And so I just, I love being able to make a referral and, and connect you um, to someone that, that will really work well with you. So, um, and I just, I like what you, what you put out there too, your podcasts and, and just, I think we need as much positivity as we can get right now. And that's kind of your brand. It's sort of coach Liz, super positive <laughs> woman. So I love, I love it. it. Thank you. Well, those of you who are listening or if you're watching the video, uh, please share this episode with anyone that you feel can benefit from it. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And you can always reach out to me if you're looking for any other type of topics or I just love to hear from you. So thank you so much. And until next time, this is Liz, your career coach and job search ally. 